bless the Lord for you and to all of you, the Lord's people. The word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 20. The Mathenian writer writes and he brings us to this conversation. Verse 13, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say unto you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. While walking through the forest one day, a man found a young eagle that had fallen out of his nest. He took it home and put it in his barnyard where he soon learned to eat and behave like chickens. One day a naturalist passed by the farm and asked why is the, the king of all birds, why should he be confined to live in the barnyard and live with chickens? The farmer replied that since he had given it chicken feed and trained it to be a chicken, it had never learned to fly. Well, since now it behaved like chickens, it was no longer an eagle. Still, it has the heart of an eagle, replied the naturalist and can surely be taught to fly. He lifted the eagle toward the sky and said, you belong to the sky. He says, and not to the earth. Stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle, however, was confined and confused, and he did not know who he was, and seeing the chickens eating their food, he jumped down to be with them again. The naturalist took the bird to the roof on the house and urged him, saying, you are an eagle, stretch forth your wings and fly. But the eagle was afraid of his unknown self and the world and jumped down once more for the chicken food. Finally, the naturalist took the eagle out to the barnyard to a high mountain and he held the king of all birds high above him and encouraged him saying, you are an eagle, you belong to the sky, stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle, the eagle looked around and back towards the barnyard and up to the sky. Then the naturalist lifted him straight towards the sun and it happened that the eagle began to tremble. Slowly he stretched his wings and with a triumphant cry he soared away into the heavens. It may be that the eagle still remembers the chickens with nostalgia. It may even be that occasionally he revisits the barnyard. But as far as anyone knows, he has never returned to lead the life of a chicken. I want to talk to you briefly tonight about a church with an identity crisis. A church with an identity crisis. In the text, Jesus has a conversation with the disciples. He begins to question them as he is about to establish the kingdom of God in the earth. And the Bible tells us in the text that Jesus establishes the church on the revelation that he is the Christ. Somehow, Jesus wanted to make sure that before he went further with these disciples, after all of his investment, walking with them and showing them the very power of God and understanding the move of God, he wanted to be clear that they were all on the same page. Jesus asked the question, he says, whom do men say that I am? And they began to give him responses. But the real issue is that when Peter opened his mouth, he opened his mouth at the right time saying the right thing. 
You know, sometimes you can open your mouth at the right time and say the wrong thing. Sometimes you can open your mouth at the wrong time and say the right thing. But Peter this time is very clear that there's an unction of the Holy Ghost. And he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus establishes the church on the revelation that he is the rock. He is the Christ. He gives authority to his disciples to steward the church's mission. Or in this case, the agenda of the church. He says, here's some keys that I want you to manage the church. Notice Jesus give keys to manage, but he doesn't give keys to own. Oh, I wish we could preach tonight. Because the, the real issue is, is that we don't own the church, but we are managers of the church. We are owners of nothing, but we are managers of the kingdom. And so he gives us keys to manage his agenda. He reminds them that the church doesn't dictate to heaven, but it replicates what's happening in heaven should happen on earth. He says, matter of fact, with these keys, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. What are you saying, Jesus? Well, the, the text would suggest that the old rabbis understood that there were things that they would forbid in, in the Jewish worship. There were things that they just would not allow. Not that they were being uh, fogeyish or stuffy, but they just understood that that wasn't going on in heaven, so it shouldn't be going on in earth. Oh, man. I wonder what would happen to us if we return to binding and loosing. Not binding people we don't like and loosing money that we want. Not binding certain things and loosing other things. But how about we just do what the Bible says. If it's not happening in heaven, then it shouldn't be happening in the church. He reminds them. And I love Eugene Peterson's translation of the message. Translation says, and that's not all. You will have complete and free access to God's kingdom. Keys to open any and every door. No barriers between heaven and earth. Between earth and heaven. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. And a no on earth is a no in heaven. Do you know who you are? That God has given you the ability to say yes and no, and based upon what is happening in heaven, we are to replicate that in the earth. Oh, I love worship because I realize that I don't come to church to worship God. I don't create worship, but worship is already going on. Worship is a continuum that's happening right now. You may be sitting in the seats, but the angels in heaven are rejoicing and worshiping and praising God. And have you ever been in a good service where you feel like heaven came down to your local church? Heaven didn't come down. You just tapped in to what was already going on. They were already worshiping. They were already blessing God. They were already giving him thanks. And you tapped in. Touch somebody say, I think I want to tap in. I want to tap into what God is doing. I want to tap in to his move. I want to tap in to his power. I want to tap in to the anointing. I want to tap in to what the revelation of God. So that it is not me, but it is me cooperating with God. So God can do whatever he wants to do in my life. I want God to throw his weight around. I want God to walk in my situation. To move my furniture and tell me. I'm here for you. He says, if it ain't happening in heaven, it shouldn't be happening on the earth. Oh, man, I want to stay there, but I got to go. If it ain't happening in heaven, then it shouldn't be happening in the earth. Jesus says in this text that the church is the only authorized institution in the earth that can deal with the devil. Oh, y'all don't like this, but let me help you with something. You can take your wonderful, expensive, foreign car. You can't take it around the corner to the Midas dealer. Because the Midas dealer is not an authorized dealer in this particular specialty. 
So you got a special thing that you need to take it to a specialist. And Jesus says that the church is the institution, the only licensed institution, the only institution in the earth with the authority to deal with the devil. Oh, you need some Bible. The Bible tells me that a man brought his lunatic son to Jesus' disciples that he that they would cast him out and they could not. But Jesus says, bring him to me. Come on, touch somebody and say, this is a case for Jesus. Some things we are taking people and I have no problem with the social sciences, the medical sciences and all of the wonderful people in the world to help us deal with our emotional and mental imbalances. But after the Prozac doesn't work and after all the other stuff, you need to bring them to Jesus. You need to say, God, we tried everything. Like the woman with the issue of blood, she had given all that she had and she was nothing bettered. I wonder is there anybody tonight that has given everything you got and your situation's no better. I want to encourage you to bring it to Jesus. I gotta go, I gotta go, have a seat. So that's why we have the right to tell the devil to hush. We've got the right to tell the devil in our situation no more. We've got the right, oh, can I touch and agree with somebody that's walking in your authority. If your head is bowed down today, if you are drowning in your own tears, if your heart is broken, I'm here to tell you there's a miracle in your mouth. The only thing you have to do is open it up and say, I have the right to stop this right now in the name of Jesus. How confused the multitudes were. They were they were confused. They were confused about Christ. They held him in high esteem. They ranked him as one of the great prophets, but they lacked the perception to see him as the son of the living God. Now, before you jump on these disciples, we need to jump on each other. Because Craig Groeschel has a wonderful book out called The Christian Atheist, where he says that we believe in God, but we live like God don't exist. We believe in God, we have head knowledge. We believe in God, we come to church. We believe in God, I'm the star pupil in the Sunday school class. We believe in God, I raise the most offering. We believe in God, I make the most in the fundraisers. We believe in God because it's necessary for our local and human survival, but we act like God doesn't exist. When the enemy shows up, what you believe ought to move and translate into the authority that God has given you. I've given you keys to the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose. Come on, let's just try it. Lay hands on somebody and tell them I loose the blessing of the Lord, the favor of God. I loose the glory of his wonder. I loose the power of the Holy Ghost working in you. Come on and open your mouth. Dr. Hennings, it's interesting that Jesus intentionally raises this conversation at Caesarea Philippi. Jesus is interesting because he starts a conversation in strategic places. The reason why I picked the Matthew text is because Matthew is a Jew that writes to Jews about a Jew. He's trying to make sure that they understand that he is the Christ. And so in Caesarea Philippi, named after Philip Caesar, who had the city named in his honor. It's interesting that Jesus, in the backdrop of the authority of the Roman Empire, asked, whom do men say that I am? How do I rank in the context of what's happening in the world? 
And then it's interesting that Jesus says, uh, Philip Caesar built this city and invested it, but he made them name it after him. He says, I just want you to name who I am by what I do. You got to get this. The problem is we're calling people a whole bunch of names, but they ain't doing nothing. Oh, no, come on. We, we, we got title. We create titles for folk just to make them feel comfortable. But I'm here to tell you that there ought to be something that comes because you do what they call you. This existential conversation produces keen insight to the disciples' present reality and thinking concerning Jesus. They say, they say that you are Elijah, Jeremiah, John the Baptist. The only problem with they say is that all they're talking about, everybody they refer to is dead. Because the real issue is there's a whole lot of us that try to live this living experience of Christ in a dead perception. We're trying to have life while we're holding on to death. We're trying to have dreams while we're living in our memories. We're trying to have vision while we're packing up. I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ is alive and well. And he wants you to move forward. The irony of the question begs an answer from their past understanding. They bring up death while the living Christ is before them. New concept for the disciples. Here it is. New concept. You ready for it? He says, Peter, God moves on Peter to say, thou art the Christ. You're not one of the prophets. You are the son of God. Beloved, can I tell you how real, how important that is? Because I believe the church has forgotten that Jesus is the Christ. He is the son of the living God. He is by the revelation of God. Everything that we live, everything that we are, everything that we hope to be, it is in Christ. Paul says in Galatians 2 and 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm moving quickly to my seat. Notice this, that in this conversation, no one hears this conversation but the disciples. Jesus was not preaching this to the world. Jesus was not preaching this to the community. He only had a conversation with the disciples. They're the only ones that heard it. Jesus says that the church will be governed by the disciples or teachers in training or apostles, but it will be utilized by the world. But it is a kingdom church that is governed by kingdom principles and will only attract kingdom people. The gates of hell will not prevail against a kingdom church. Can you say a kingdom church? You see, he says that the church is established for the kingdom. And he says the church is the counterculture to the world. The church is not the buddy of the world. The church is not supposed to try to win the world. But the church, watch this, win the world in this sense. Win them by influence, by incentive. Win them by friendship that has nothing to do with conviction. But the church should be the counterculture to the world so that the world comes from the world into the church because of the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost working in us can somebody say amen God's church God's people and God's agenda creates a crisis in identity and it must be separated from the confusion of the world about whether we are eagles or whether we're chickens because they weren't sure Jesus pushes this and he says, you got to go from talk to testimony. He says, because there are too many of you talking, but I want to make sure that they are talking, but I want to make sure you have a testimony. Can I preach here? 
You see, talk comes from perception. Talk comes from gossip. Come on, you know talk. Talk, you know, stuff they say that they don't know. Stuff they, they allege that they're not sure of. You know talk. It happens when we gather and when we break. Talk in the bathroom, talk in the lobby. We talk. But we talk from perception and not necessarily testimony. Jesus says that if I'm going to establish the church, it just can't be a talking church. It can't be a church that talks. It must be a church that functions. And I don't know about you, but for some of us, we could be arrested for identity theft. You, you know, we got his name, but we're not him. Ain't nobody talking to me. We, we wear his clothes, but we're not him. You ain't looking at me right. I'm trying to help you that we could be arrested for calling ourselves people of Jesus without Jesus' power, without Jesus' compassion, without Jesus' love, without Jesus' diligence, without Jesus' fervor. Come on, come on, come on here. The real issue is you got to ask yourself, did I steal his identity and didn't take his power? Did I steal his name and didn't take his, his function? Did I steal his identity? And people are looking at me because I'm wearing his name until they're in a crisis. Well, come on, I got Bible for this. That same man that brought his lunatic son to Jesus' disciples, they figured since you hang out with him. I know it's late, but could y'all just stay with me for a minute? He says, listen, since you hang out with him, every time I see you, every time I see him, I see you. I, I see you walking in front of him. I see you walking behind him. I see you all the time. Y'all eat together. You're always hanging out. So I don't need Jesus if you've been with him then do what he does. He says, I don't want you to be a talking church. I want you to be a church that has a testimony. You remember testimony that I was sick, but the Lord healed me. You remember testimony that I was on death's door, but could the saints pray. You remember testimony. People that came to church with goiters in the neck and the church was in revival and they'd spit them out. You remember testimony that I once was lost in sin and Jesus found you remember testimony anybody got a testimony I was I was about to die but the Lord saved me let me go testimony comes but says he says he says who do they say and then he says who do you say Come on. Because see, the deal is Jesus is trying to figure out if that's the public opinion. Tell me what the private, what's the internal polling? Give me the internal numbers. If they say this, then what are you saying? Because the real issue is there's a crisis in identity when you say what they say. Oh man, I want to preach here. I say when you say what they say, when the world says that, you know what, same-sex marriage is all right, and you say it's all right too. When, 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 so when there is political oppression and we are oppressing the poor and you say it's okay, then all of a sudden the kingdom has a problem when you say what they say because you should be saying something different than what they say because you know him. He walks with you. He talks with you. He tells you that he is your own. And the joy we share as we tarry there. I got to go, but let me just share with you that you've got to watch what you say. Because if you, what you say sounds like what they say, then the world can't tell the difference between them and us. We ought to say something different, not just look different, not just walk different. We're more than suits and hats and shirts. We're more than skins. We're more than that. We, we do something. And they shall lay hands upon the sick and they 
come on, and they, and they, they shall recover. Look at somebody and say, recover, recover, recover. Whatever has got you, recover from it. Wherever you're falling, recover. Wherever you slip, recover. Wherever you messed up, recover. Let me go. The church. Sit down, y'all. Sit down, please. The church. The church that God formed has been framed by church culture. God created a church. He formed a church. And then the church created a culture that said, we don't want to be what God formed, but we'll just be what we frame it. Oh, you need Bible for it. Here it go. God created man in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. He said, let us make man. Man is, watch this, a spirit that has a soul that lives in a body. But he was created in Genesis 1, 26. But then God formed something in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed from the dust of the ground. Because he already made a spirit, he put it in something. You've got to understand that God formed the church when Jesus was having this conversation and he wanted to make sure that they would not go error. So he says, I want to know that I am the rock. I'm the thing that makes the church work. You will just assist me, but you are not the head of the church. Watch this. We don't live out our God because the church has created a culture that refuses to be what God formed. When we don't live out our God-given identity, we suggest that we have problems with the Creator's intentions. Come on, y'all. When we don't walk out who God says we are, then we're saying, I got a problem with what God said. He says you are holy. He says you are righteous. He says you are washed. He says you are redeemed. But when you let other people speak and then you say what they say, you have rejected what God says and now you are not what God formed. You are what people framed. Touch three people and say, I got framed. I got framed. I got framed. I got framed. My title framed me. My reputation framed me. My money framed me. My image framed me. My ego framed me. I got framed. I'm stuck and I can't get out. Oh God, I'm trying to move. That's why you called, I called my children my oldest child who graduates in May with two masters, a master's in business association, business administration, and a master's in health administration. I call her, her name is Kiana. I call her Kiana. I call my daughter Casey. I call my daughter Destiny. And watch this, I don't call them Boo Boo. I don't call them Bay Bay because there's a name associated with what I've given them. And watch this, their friends may call them something else to shorten their name but when they shorten their name they diminish their stature and as a result they keep hearing that they're baby and they're not their God-given name so they relinquish their future they abandoned the promise of God they acquiesce from the power of the living Christ and watch this we have done the same thing we have allowed the world to call us something we call each other something and we have diminished our God-given identity lean over and tell somebody this is the convocation so watch this being Kojic cannot be more important than taking cities We've created a Kojic culture that is more like a social political organization with religious overtones. But God gave the name to Bishop Mason in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 14 that we were to be called the church of God in Christ. Look at somebody and say, I am 
the church of God in Christ. I'm not part of the culture. I'm not part of the club. I'm not part of the gang. I'm a part of the theological expression of the local assembly as revealed by the Holy Ghost to a sainted man who stayed in prayer and has now spawned millions around the world. I feel some cold spirits. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus, when he established the kingdom church, he established a kingdom church. He didn't establish a church church. And we have taken the kingdom church and we made it church church. Church church is social, but it's not spiritual. It attends everything, every function, but it has no power in the chat and chew sessions. We go from here and there and we are no better but I'm here to tell you a kingdom church is social because it's spiritual church church builds from within but a kingdom church reaches out to the world church church keeps circulating and recycling the same folk in the same thing doing the same old thing and we sit back and act like we just got it oh this is just the way it is but that's not what Jesus created he created a dynamic church that would always move forward a church that would take cities a church that would take nations a church that would move by his power and his revelation Church, church is rigid and predictable, but a kingdom church is spontaneous and generous. I said it's spontaneous. What does a kingdom church? It says, I just feel the unction of the Lord and I feel the move in this. Anybody ever had an unction of the Lord? It's a spontaneous move. It is God's divine creativity in the moment of your situation. It is a spontaneous church. It's a church that will raise a million dollars tonight because it's just spontaneous. Are we here? I got to go. Sit down, y'all. Please. The identity crisis is the fact that you've got eagles living with chickens, eating chicken food, being trained and raised by chicken farmers, and it's easier to be a chicken than it is to be an eagle. It's easier to hang out in the coop. It's easier to get three hots in a cot. It's easier. But the problem is that God has brought his people into another realm of reality. I really I want to close, but he says that God's people, watch this, are weird. Can you handle that? You see, because normal isn't working. When Jesus established the church, he established weird people. That's why on the day of Pentecost, they couldn't figure out why they loved one another, why they went from house to house, why were they breaking bread, why were they selling everything they had, laying it at the apostles' feet. This was not normal, but they noticed that the church continued to grow, and the Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved. So let me give you this. The real issue is that God's people... And God's church must walk in harmony. But God's people should be people of good news. Yeah, you know, we should always have the gospel in us. God's people should be a people that accepts, but not necessarily approves. Ain't nobody talking to me. Our problem is that we want to approve everybody before we accept them. But Jesus, at the woman at the well, he did not approve of her life, but he accepted who she was so that he could bring her into a new reality. You need to touch three people and say, back up off me. He accepted 
everything that came to him. He didn't approve of everything. But I'm here to tell you that our churches will grow when we learn to accept that everybody doesn't come the way we came. Everybody doesn't have the same experience that we've had. But if we just love them, we can walk them into a new relationship so that they can have peace with God. The other thing is, not only accept is we need to learn to pay attention. Pay attention to one another. That means stop, look, and care about what you heard them say. You ought to be affectionate. You know, people, um, people need, uh, watch this, eight to ten non-sexual touches a day. One more time, eight to ten non-sexual touches. The real issue is that we are becoming an isolated community. We're living in silos and singing solo, but when we come together, we wonder where is the power because there is no fellowship. We need to be affectionate with one another. And then we need to appreciate one another. Can you take 30 seconds to tell somebody how much you appreciate them? Come on, just tell them how much I appreciate you. Look over and tell them, I couldn't do this without you. Hallelujah. I couldn't do this without you. I couldn't do it. Come on, tell them. I appreciate you. There's something about you that makes it work for me. That this wouldn't be worth coming if you weren't here. There's been ways and things that you've done for me that I just didn't get time to say thank you. But when I was feeling bad, you came along and helped me. I just want to say I appreciate you. See, when we appreciate one another, when we know and esteem others, appreciating you breaks the self-centeredness in me and it breaks the spirit of discouragement off you. You see, when I learn to appreciate you, I'm not selfish. So we've got to accept people. We have to pay attention. We have to be affectionate. We have to learn how to appreciate. And watch this. We have to learn how to admit who we are and who we are not. The God in you should connect with the failure in me and you should share him with me to bear me up. I said the God in you ought to connect with the failure in me and you ought to share that with me so that you can hold me up when I'm not at my best. Come on, look at somebody. I'm going to hold you up when you're not at your best. I'm going to keep you strong when you're weak. I'm going to make sure that I'm standing with you when you can't stand on your own. And then lastly, God's people are attached. We need to be attached to each other no matter what. Oh, the world's got a saying, Bishop, they say ride or die. That means that we're just going to be together, come what may. When we get that type of togetherness in the church, when we determine that you may not always be right, and when you're not right, I'm going to tell you you're not right. And because you want to be right, you'll accept the correction that you are not right so that we can get you right. We can't throw anybody away, but we can make everybody right. My time is up. But before I go, I tell you that Jesus left the church five things. Ask me what? Jesus left the church an unfinished mission. In Matthew 28 and 19, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. He says there's an unfinished mission, so there's still something that you need to do. The second thing Jesus left the church was an unchallenged message. Acts 1 and 3 says, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He left them an unshakable testimony. Ha ha ha. Unshakable testimony. He left them the living word, the witness that's in our life. He left them the written word, the Bible that's the book for me. I stand upon the word of God. It's the B-I-B-L-E. He left us his word. And then finally, Jesus left us an unchanging promise that this same Jesus, this same Jesus who came, who was taken from you, 
will come up into heaven in like manner as ye saw him go up into the heaven. He's going to come back the same way he went because there's a promise for you. Just as Jesus left, he shall return. Jesus left bodily and he shall return bodily. He left visibly and he shall return visibly. He left in person and he shall return in person. He left in a cloud and he shall return on a cloud. Jesus left from the Mount of Olives and he shall return to the Mount of Olives. But here's what I want to tell you. The real issue is that Jesus left the church with eagles and not chickens. Look at somebody and tell them I don't have a crisis in identity. I know who I am and I know whose I am. Hallelujah. I love the fact that Jesus left the church with eagles because 26 times in scripture he refers to them. And the thing about chickens is chickens hide. In the storm they hide. In trouble they hide. Chickens talk and hide. But eagles hide in the storm. They take the thing that's messing with them and they build on it. Just expand your wings. Tell somebody I'm an eagle and I'm going to fly on this. I'm going to fly on this trouble. I'm going to fly on this circumstance. I'm going to fly on this problem. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put your hands together and bless the Lord in this place. If there is someone tonight who has an identity crisis, the real issue is that you're not who you think you are. And you're not who others think you are. But you are what you think others think you are. And you're trying to walk that out. Some people are tired of the crisis. And if that's you tonight, I want you to stand on your feet. If you're caught in betwixt in between, if you've been hurt so bad that you've had to become something else, then today I'm here to tell you that Jesus wants to end your identity crisis. He is the Christ. He is the son of the living God. If, you, if you're in this auditorium tonight, I want you to simply raise your hand and say, Pastor, tonight I'm done with my identity crisis, that I will be everything that the Lord has called me to be. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this time in your presence. And we pray even now, Father, that this word has spoken to the very hearts of your people. We thank you that we lift it up before you. And now, God, let us walk it out. For we will not say what they say because we have relationship with you. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now we pray for these thy people in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. And amen. Will you put your hands together and bless the Lord? Never alone, never alone, he walks with me